Welcome. Today, we are talking about cassava. Cassava is food crop and cash crop to many people across Africa. 500 million Africans cultivate cassava, and Nigeria forms a large chunk of that number. On our table in Nigeria, we hardly can do without cassava. Some people even joke that the reason we cannot live abroad for too long is because of cassava. Because we will be missing it, but we will miss Gary, we will miss Fufu, Abacha, and the rest of them. So the man that we'll be talking to today is a plant breeder and geneticist who has worked on cassava for more than 20 years. He's a joint appointee of the National Root Crops Research Institute, NRCRI in Umudike, and the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, RITA, in Ibadan. He is Director of Biotechnology and Seed System at Umudike and Next Gen Cassava Breeding Project Director at IITA, Professor Chidozie Egesi, you are welcome. Thank you. Good evening. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, um, Prof, I have described cassava in my own layman terms as very important to Nigerians. I even say that many Nigerians may even think they may not be able to survive outside cassava where there is no cassava that is. Have I been exaggerating? How important is this crop to us as a nation? Thank you. So as, as a people, we have become acculturized to cassava since the 16th century. So you're talking about food that we have associated with for more than five centuries today. So it is important to us. And most importantly, is it is a crop that is hardy. It thrives where other crops fail, you know, when you have climate change. And today we're having pandemic lockdown. So in such difficult circumstances, you will see that crops like other crops like grains and cereals, they fail because there's intermittent drought during the rainy season, like we had in Nigeria this year. So those kind of crops will fail, but cassava will thrive and be able to feed the people, be able to give them the food they need. Uh, it doesn't fail the, the poorest person. Cassava cannot fail the poorest person. At uh, the same way, a, a wealthy person who wants to use it to create wealth, who wants to use it to create employment or better the lives of people, cassava can also be responsive if you it's an industrial crop. So it costs through the you know, not many crops can do that. Whether you are small or big, cassava is for you and is able to, you know, stay with you even if everything else fails. So that is why it is important. And we have made it a part of our food that hardly does, for some people, hardly does any day pass without a meal of cassava or even more than a meal of cassava daily. So it's, it's something that is important to us. And I will end that with saying that is a crop that can really drive a country's economy. So if you're looking into having an agrarian economy, then you and you are in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, then you really need to think about cassava as one of your major crops. Because cassava is a crop that can give you a quantum supply of energy. Okay, let me break it down. You can get the yield you can get within a, 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 a unit area within a short time. No other crop can compete. For example, for starch, starch is a big uh, commodity. So no other crop that, that we grow here in Africa can really compete with the productivity of cassava for starch if we want to go industrial, and that's important. Because of the importance of cassava, over the years, we've had all kinds of uh, uh, research going on and all kinds of varieties uh, released, you know, improved varieties, vitamin A fortified, this fortified, that fortified. What is it again with cassava? What haven't we heard about cassava that now necessitates this next gen that you are doing. There's an adage that says that you don't build Rome in one day. So our case is one of a continuous improvement. I remember some years ago in the 80s when we were very young, we had what they call the death of cassava, but it was cassava millibug. It was just wiping off cassava from 
you know, the farms of smallholders. And there was something that was done, and we got resistant uh, materials apart from the control. Um, we got resistant. Then a decade later, that's in the 90s, we started hearing viruses. Viruses were wiping out cassava in certain parts of East Africa. And we were so afraid for West Africa. And today, we have made progress. After that, in, in 2010, 2011, we released vitamin A cassava. So that is the one you refer to as biofortified. And that is also a progress. But like you want to build a big city, you start from the foundation and you start laying the blocks. So the question should be, how much value have we added to the ones that are existing? I was, I'll make bold to say that today we have varieties that are outperforming in terms of yield, outperforming in terms of resistance to pests and diseases, even outperforming in the kitchen in terms of culinary qualities of the varieties that we are calling our best varieties for today in the market, varieties like TME419. We have varieties that we think and we believe are better than it right now, and we hope to release that soon. Now, talking about the 419 variety, it does seem scientists are now thinking of marketing and uh, Brandon, I understand you had a naming ceremony for cassava recently. Why is that? We named a few old varieties, uh, giving them names that they never had because what they had were code names, like I mentioned, serial numbers. And the farmers don't relate to those serial numbers because they don't know what it means. They don't. It doesn't mean anything to anybody, actually, if you're not one of the... Even for scientists who did not, who are not directly involved, it doesn't mean anything. So that has implications for marketing and I, I i would say for example you release a variety and call it variety a1 in umudike and you take it to a farmer in um in asaba and they grow it for like one or two years and they just convert the name to variety b1 it hasn't changed it's only the name that changed then you take it to a bado and the bado farmer says it's c1 and you take it to Mokwa in Niger State, and the farmers there says it's D1. So if you go to Mokwa and say, I want A1, they will say they don't know what you're talking about. They, they know only D1. And that is not a good thing. You cannot track progress. You cannot even make good references about the work we're doing and how much impact it is having in the lives of farmers or in the lives of the uh, citizens. So we, we now know that you know, like you said, we have understood that error and we've corrected it. So what we now did is that we talked to communication experts and also branding experts. And we said, we want to have the farmer participate this time. In fact, actually to be the active player and we will be observers. So we threw, threw out a survey to the Nigeria Cassava Growers Association, their national chairman, and also to the state chapters, especially where cassava is grown in a big in, in quantum. And we asked them to suggest names for the varieties that are already growing. And they suggested too many names. So we collated them and asked them to vote because there were too many names. And they voted those names. And some of the names they call one variety farmer's pride. They called another one Ayaya. Ayaya is a is a word for beautiful for in, in the Aquibom area in the South South. So so and there are, there's a music they, they say yeah yeah something so people relate to the name there's one that they call game changer and you know when you look at that variety the names they are giving them are really symbolic of the character of those varieties either in the field or in the in the kitchen and, and they call it game changer because they think it's going to do better than um, uh, is already doing better in the field than 419. It's doing better also in the kitchen. And those are important for branding. So if we want to now sell our varieties, we sell them with those names. And those names are names that are cut across ethnic ethnic backgrounds or regions in, in Nigeria, whether it's geographical, um, geopolitical zones, it cuts across. There's one that they call um, um, Obasanjo 2. Uh, there's one they call hope. So those are names of varieties that are coming on. And whenever you say hope in Kebi State, you hope variety hope in Kebi State, you mean the same as variety hope in Aquaibom State, something like that. Why do you call cassava or basonjo? Well, I, I couldn't question the farmers, but if a few of them that spoke said, 
the cassava is tough and behaves like the person they named it after. And they know why they did that. And it wasn't only Obasanjo that was given to them for that variety, but they voted, all voted massively for the name Obasanjo. Maybe it's also a recognizable name. So when you say, I need variety, Obasanjo, it raises an interest. It's also a good marketing strategy. So, so it works in any way. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I, 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 I deliberately spend time on this because you see what we aim to do in this publication is public understanding of science. We want science that people can relate to. Specifically, what are those issues with cassava that you are trying to resolve? You know, I'm like I told you before that we've been following cassava for decades and yet you are still on cassava research. So what are these predominant problems you're trying to solve? Cassava has been, you know, improved for many years, at least for five decades in, in Nigeria. Let me even use Nigeria as an example. Um, but when you look at cassava productivity in Nigeria or even in Africa and compared with that in Asia, compared with that in, in South America, you see that we are producing lower than those people. Why some of those people who hit 20 tons per hectare in farmers' fields, our own will hit um, less than 10, which is not good especially given the importance of the crop, even in our climate. So uh, what are the issues? It may not just be only breeding. It may not be breeding alone. It may not be genetics alone. But genetics is the beginning. Because if you miss that, then you have missed every other thing. Every other thing you are going to do is going to be patchy. And so you need, this, you need the, to get the right seed, which is improved variety. Then you need to now work on the agronomy, assuming agronomy is an issue. Um, and it is an issue in our, in, in our continent. So we need all of that to work. But I'm, I'm talking about next-gen cassava breeding project, which is a, a breeding project focused. Um, we collaborate with the agronomists in our work. So what are the issues? How can we raise the productivity of cassava from less than 10 tons per hectare in a farmer's field to more than 20 tons per hectare and it becomes consistent and you know everywhere you grow it. You need the right genetics. Now cassava is a long duration crop. It takes time to to you know, do breeding for cassava. And you know cassava stays like uh, 12 months before it matures. So while other crops take like uh, uh, three to four months. So those are challenges that we think our project can solve by tweaking science. And we, we've made some progress in that. We have cut short the time it takes us to breed. And we've also been able to you know, accentuate the, the favorable genes now, I won't go more than that. Favorable genes that are important for improving yield, improving productivity, improving resilience to weather climate or disease or pests. And we, we also put into consideration what the farmers and the market women are considering as reasons why they prefer a variety to another. And we are integrating all this into the work we do to make uh, the right selections. And you mentioned something about a scientist not consulting widely. So that is a, a good point you've made there. And we are doing what we call participatory research. I will give you an example of what we call citizen science. We may be evaluating 200 lines of cassava, but each farmer, you know, we, and we may be dealing with like 300 farmers, but each farmer receives only three of those 200 varieties. So when they receive those three, it's only a phone call. We don't even need to spend money to go. They grow it in their farms and they will evaluate it with some little initial training. So they will tell us, you know, there's a color code for best. There's a color code for worst. And if they say this one is worst and best and worst, you know the one that is in the middle. So with that, you will now take a frequency of how many of those clones, which ones scored best most, and it begins to give us a sense about how to 
do participatory selection of new varieties. And the farmers are excited that they are participating in it. We are also excited that we are getting feedback from our real end users. It's not only the farmers that we're working with. We're working with processors. We're working with large-scale proce cassava processors, people who produce um, high-quality cassava flour, because they need to make an input into the kind of variety that will give them the best flour, and that will also give them the higher flour yield you know, per, per ton of roots. Let me be straight. Some people are of the opinion that the kind of project you're doing now, this next gen, is genetic modification of cassava through the back door. Is that what you're doing? Absolutely no. So it is not genetic modification by any means. Um, so we do not insert any genes and we do not, we make crosses in the field. But we use the power of biotechnology because you can't make, you can't continue doing science in the way it was done in 16th century and think you are going to get the results of 21st century. So biotechnology is very good, but we are not using genetic modification in our own effort in next gen cassava breeding project. I, I would, I'll make that clear. But we use, um, we extract DNA and we use you know, the, the, the nucleotides, they, they, are, they are building blocks in the DNA that we use to make a pattern and we do a selection on those bases. And then we use it to, you know, associate or correlate it with the observations we get in the field. And they help us to make a selection and the accuracy. We, we, we predict how the, the new varieties will perform based on the performance of the appearance. And that's a prediction modeling. So we do modeling and it helps us to you know, move faster. Uh, so I wouldn't go deeper into the science, but the, the kind of science we do is bioinformatics. You know, if you want to say biotechnology is bioinformatics, where we associate those gene codings with the performance, the traits like yield, like disease resistance that we score when we get to the field. So it is not genetic modification by any means. Now, you say you're doing this in many African countries. What exactly are you aiming at in the end? What we are doing is what you call um, uh, a decentralized breeding. You know, we all come together. We know the tools we need. But the tools we need, we will now use it to serve our purposes according to, you know, like customized solution to your country. For example... I'll even give you an example in Nigeria. When you get to Southwest Nigeria and you say Gari, you know, Ijebu Gari is not the same as Ibo Gari you buy in Oweri. So, you know, it has implication for the breeder, for the scientists who wants to develop it. Now, you now go to Uganda. They don't even know what you call Gari. They do boil and eat and then they do flour. So there are different needs. So what we have done is we know that there's one tool that can serve any need. So these scientists are focusing on what suits their countries best. Um, you mentioned it, we're in 13 organizations in, you know, 13 organizations worldwide, but in Africa alone, we are about 10 organizations. So we are, we are, we are, we are in four continents, in, in two countries in South America, Brazil and Colombia. We're in Germany, we're in the US, we are in Tanzania, Uganda, Nigeria, Ghana, Syria alone, um, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, we are in Rwanda. We are, we, are, we are in Zambia. So we are all over the places that cassava is very important, Mozambique, Malawi, um, in Africa. And what we are trying to do is raise up a set of breeders, a set of scientists that will say, this is, a, this is, a, this is what we need to breed for in our own country. And then we give them the power to make that happen faster. This is what we need. And they need to now talk to their farmers, to their stakeholders, to everybody in a participatory uh, um, research approach. And that's what we are doing to make sure that cassava serves its purpose according to the needs of the people. So it's no longer uh, a centralized, this is what we need to breed for. Why should I tell somebody in Tanzania to breed for Gary, breed cassava for Gary, when the people don't even know what Gary is? So that's the point. So how does this benefit the rural farmer? In each of the countries, it benefits them in the sense that we already ask them what is their best varieties in the market and why is it their best varieties? Like, tell us uh, your first three best varieties. Can we make it better than what you have? 
And the answer is from our work, we have shown that we can make it better. Um, we have better varieties than 419 in Nigeria as of today. They outyield it. They have higher dry matter. They have better gari qualities. They, they even gari yield because we have something we call gari yield. is better, is higher, I mean, than 419. So by all means, I would not know why a farmer would be stuck. In fact, they've already started dropping it and asking us for the new varieties that we are yet to release. We, we hope to release that between now and December. Um, so they already ask him, when you go to Uganda, it may not concern us, but it's also important to note. In Uganda, we are giving them varieties that are higher, that are, have higher resistance to what they call a cassava brown streak disease, a disease that is in East Africa and South, East Central and South Africa, but not in West Africa. And is a very devastating disease that causes rotting of the roots, but it's viral. So it's difficult to breed for. But we've been able to go there and give them varieties that are better than what they have. So that is the impact of our work for the poor farmers. In Nigeria, we are replacing, I will say the word, we are replacing TME 419 with better varieties. And we are trying to make sure that our new varieties, which the farmers have them by themselves called a game changer, is spread all over West Africa where they can be used for Gary, um, whether you are in Syria alone where they know Gary, or you are in Ghana where they also know Gary. So those are things we are doing now. Okay. I mean, we, 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 we may be talking about Gary, then we're talking about Kufu and, and, and all these things. Are these all that we can actually do? We are working with people in the private sector who are large-scale cassava uh, processors. We have one they call Thai Farm, another one they call Psaltry. Uh, they're mostly in southwest Nigeria, but the other ones in that are a little smaller in southeast, south, south. And we're working with them. So cassava can produce starch more than any other crop in this climb. So uh, it is important for us to know that. And even though they are used by industry, the industry don't get enough roots of what they need. You know, their, their, their capacity, the capacity of their plants, their industrial plant is higher than what they get. And that is because productivity is low. So it now comes to a point that even the small farmer may not just be producing cassava for Gary alone anymore. Uh, even young scientists, I mean, young, young school leavers, young, young farmers, because we're looking for youth to get into agriculture. Young farmers can now begin to say, I have a ready market in a factory. Uh, if I produce cassava this much and of this specific variety that they require, I have it, they're already ready to sell to me. In fact, they have um, what you call a, a guarantee supply scheme where they contract out production. So uh, uh, the, the young farmer knows that he's going to or she's going to produce for this company. And this company knows that uh, this area of land is being produced with specific variety for our factory plant. So that is very important in job creation. That is very important in income generation. And uh, people can really see that there's ready market for cassava. Uh, and it's not necessarily for, this, for the market women who sell gari and fufu, but even the industries who make glucose, who make um, ethanol, uh, who make uh, uh, starch or high quality cassava flour. And, and there are many other products that you can use cassava for. Um, so so the, the opportunities are bound. And today that we are suffering from pandemic lockdown, there's no better opportunity than for um, both the government and the private sector to invest into agriculture using cassava as a test case. At what point will all this research now become standard offerings in our academic institutions. When do they leave research institutions to academic institutions where a lot more people can be taught uh, and these same people will understand these things and move out to become like extension officers and spread all these things to farm and farmers nationwide? Some of these things are not good to be done by government or public agencies. Some of them needs to be done by private sector. Some of them need to be done by people who understand how to do business. And, um, uh, so, so what IITA and NRCRI did is to form new companies um, and their private they are public-private sector, uh, public-private partnership companies. For Umudike, for NRCRI, it's called Umudike Seeds. 
and for IITA, it is called IITA Go Seed. So these are uh, seed companies made to produce seeds and sell to farmers directly and to make sure that the quality of seeds they are selling is of the highest standard, the highest grade, so that there's no contamination or mixtures that um, have, uh, that will usually uh, affect uh, productivity in the farms and you go to the farmer's field you give the farmer uh, the farmer went to a small uh, a rural market and bought a bundle of cassava and they plant it out they are seeing two instead of one uh, because they have mixed them up so these companies are meant to ensure that these things are being these new technologies don't remain in the shelf or in the research station anymore but they are, there's a ready market in the in the in, in, in for farmers to buy uh, improved seed from that is important because in the past we have depended on public agencies that are not well funded government does not have money these days and they, they barely pay salary in many of the organizations but they don't have money to extend these things some of the extension officers don't have motorbikes and these are not profitable these are things that are not sustainable for government to do but when you have a company who knows that they will they will either they either swim or sink you know, in the market, they will know how to do things differently and begin to sell the right seeds to the farmers, begin to even find out where the markets are and begin to drive innovation through that means. So that's what we we are supporting. We are supporting the private public, a public private sector um, partnership um, approach to this whole thing. And we believe that it's going to change the game for for extending uh, new technologies to farmers or to end users. All right. So, well, that will be it for today. We thank you very much for watching and we thank Professor Chidoze Egesi for showing up. Thank you very much, Prof. And thanks for watching, everybody. Bye bye.